Hi, and welcome to Business Source, brought to you by Connecting Business, the show that gives you authentic conversations to help your business. There's no smoke and mirrors, just real people sharing their experiences. I'm your host, Lee Nightingale, and today I'm really excited to be talking with Jesse Fagan. Jesse is a senior tour leader and employee owner with Field Guides. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Excellent. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I've been waiting to do this one for several weeks um, because it's such an intriguing story. Uh, so left field to <laughs> other businesses and people that, that I've spoken to. But in the interest of uh, speaking to people outside of our comfort zones and what we know makes us wiser, I'm humbled and uh, really looking forward to digging deeper into uh, the business that you're involved in and you as an individual. So perhaps if we can just start with sharing uh, with the viewers and listeners a bit about what Field Guides is all about. Field Guides, well, that's a great question. Um, if you're not like anything, if you're not in this world, it's hard to understand why there are people that do these things, right? Like anything else. Um, but there is a certain sector of the population that like to bird watch, and uh, and big those business. Yeah. it's a big business, yeah. And there's different levels of bird watching. Obviously, you have the people that just sit in their backyard and look at feeders and that kind of thing. Um, but there's a, a certain a uh, percentage of those people that uh, bird watchers that like to travel and see new birds. It's sort of like maybe stamp collecting where you want to collect as many different types of stamps as possible. There are people that want to travel the world and see as many different types of birds as possible. And uh, and they have their list and they will travel the world and check off their the species that they've seen, the new birds that they've seen. And, and it's, it's a hobby for them. It's a hobby for, for a lot of people. And so we cater to that market. I work for a, a bird watching tour company called Field Guides Incorporated. We're an American based company. Uh, we have an office in Austin, Texas, and uh, we're a small and medium sized tourism company, bird, bird watching tour company uh, that employs roughly 35, 35 employees, staff and, and guides. And, uh, and so we offer, uh, we have a catalog of tours that we offer. We do tours in all seven continents all over the world. Wow. And we're running we're running between 120 to 150 tours a year, depending on what the schedule looks like for that particular year. And um, yeah, so our guides, we have uh, an office, as I said, and we, we employ six to eight people in the office in Texas. But then our guides live all over the world. We have guides that live, for, for example, myself, I live in Lima, Peru. I'm based out of Peru, but we have guides in Africa, Australia, the United States, um, Ecuador, and the guides travel. They they do depending on their schedule and uh, if they're full time or part time, they're working and doing between eight and twelve to fifteen tours a year all over the world. And um, and we've been in business for thirty five years, catering to this market market of of bird watchers, um, what we call birders, because we bird watchers <laughs> sounds a little bit passive. We like to we like to call call ourselves birders because it sounds more sporty, I guess. But uh, <laughs> we cater to this market of birders that want to travel the world and, and see new birds and have a great time. I mean, it's I think for a lot of people, birding on that level is an excuse to travel, right? You in order to see new birds, you have to go to some amazing destinations in the world and. And experience different cultures and languages and food and and for a lot of a pe for for a lot of our clients it's a it's a social experience I think more than anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm very uh, seldom stuck for 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 words, but I'm I'm just blown blown away by that because uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, it's not something that uh, I ever. Thought thought about in terms of business uh, you know you, you you rightly said there about people in the back garden we've got wonderful uh, open landscape around us where you see people with their binoculars and everything and and their their notepad notebooks and books and, and anything yeah wonderful you know that'd be great walking around your local um uh, green belt area look, looking at birds and jumping in your car and maybe 
driving to the next county and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But it never really popped into my head that there's people that actually really enjoy traveling all around the world to, to see the birds of, of the world. No, um, that's right. That's right. And, and, it's, and there's this, this stereotype of, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but there's a stereotype of, you know, the little old lady with white tennis shoes, you know, looking at, you know, feeding the birds or looking at the birdies and, and bird watching, birding as a, as a sport, as a hobby, um, is a is a quite technical and um, and uh, physical physical um, mm -hmm. hobby to do. I mean, you've got to be out hiking and climbing mountains and you know trepping through hot jungle forest and uh, and traveling. And um, it's an active it's an active pastime, very active pastime. So, would it be fair to say that uh, your clientele? Uh, is getting younger and younger and fitter. Uh, you know, do you see the opposite end of the extremes? You know, pe uh, teenagers, you know, early twenties right through to their sort of uh, more senior generation, if you like, uh, and everything in between. Because we, uh, I guess as as a human population, we've become more intrigued uh, about the planet and more aware of the planet um, and everything that inhabits that planet. Um, I, you know, for one, I'm a huge David Attenborough fan. I've watched everything he's done, pretty much. That uh, and it, it, mesmerizing is, is probably a key word for for, for him. It's a, it, he's a kind of person where you start watching the show and you don't stop, you don't pause, you don't go off and make a cup of tea. You, you know, you watch the whole thing end to end. You know, uh, and you sit there in silence, other than going "wow" um, kind of thing. Um, so we're all aware of, uh, of you know, just how diverse this, this planet is now. And I think more and more people are, are realizing, especially with this pandemic, that life is very, very short. And to have just traveled to cities and seen mm -hmm. the same thing, repeat, 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 uh, right. different food, different wine, different food, different wine, and, 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 and that kind of thing. People want more now from their leisure experience and, and their sort of, uh, have awoken and thought, wow, I better get out there and see the real side of this planet, uh, A, before I'm gone, and B, before it's gone. That's exactly right. Yeah, I I don't know. To answer your question, it's hard for me to judge. I've been in the business a while, and um, it's hard for me to to really see if there's been a dramatic shift in our our relationship, our relationship with the natural world and the environment, and whether that equates to more people out traveling and wanting to see birds, um, it's difficult. I, at times, I'm, I'm very much an optimist about, about how people feel about those sort of things. And then at times there's enough, enough uh, examples in the world where I'm, I'm not so, I'm not so, uh, <laughs> I'm not so optimistic about how, where things are going. Um, yeah. There is a small, there, I don't know if it's small, but there is a, it seems like a minority of, of young people that are very much interested in the environment at least it seems like there's more awareness of our, especially as you said, with the pandemic. Wow, it seems like now we're, we're, we're seeing the effects of our relationships with, with the natural world, our relationship with food, our relationship with habitat destruction, our relationship with uh, climate change, and, um, and, that, and that humans do have an effect. And mm -hmm. whether that equates um, to young people being more interested in bird watching, I haven't really gotten that impression. I can, I can tell you that it still feels like that our, in, in the case of field guides and the com and, and my company, our demographic is still very much the the 50 and older group, and um, I don't I don't see that shifting too much, um, at least not in the foreseeable future. But I could be wrong, and I would love to see, and I will go into this, but I think in part with with birding tours. Um, you're looking also at, at finances and, and lifestyles, and it, it takes time and money to travel a lot. And if you're in the 20 to 50 year old range, you've probably got families and work uh, commitments, and yeah. and just not the income to do these things. So there's that also. But um, there is there are young people that are birding and getting into birding as a sport and being interested in the natural world. But it's hard to to see if that's different than it was. If the percentages are different than it was, let's say, 50 years ago. Yeah, and I want to get into this later on the show. But 
it feels like what you and I spoke about before about where you're taking the business that has the potential to uh, open this world up to a younger generation being uh, the the digital platform. But I don't want to spoil spoil your thunder with with, with that, and uh, I'm really looking forward to getting in, in, into that. Sticking to the, the the business model side of things, um, sounds to me that uh, people that experience those uh, tools with you uh, are going to come back time and time again. Um, not necessarily to go to the same place. In fact, I don't know. Maybe you can tell us whether that that that's true or not. But to because they've experienced that wonderful thing. Uh, in one particular country, area, uh, continent, they come back to you again time and time to, to go to, to new continents. Yeah, then that's right. I, and I don't know if I mentioned this, we've been in business for 35 years, since 1985. And uh, we do have a high repeat clientele. We have um, roughly 70 to 75% of our clients are repeat clients. So they've taken one or yeah. more tours with us. And I think it's in part for what you what you were saying is that um, when you start to travel to see birds, it's it's an addiction. You want to see more birds. You want to see more countries. And there are there are not a lot of companies that are offering this service. It's a like I like we were saying, it's a niche niche market. And uh, there are not a lot of companies that are offering this service. So if you do want to travel to see bird watch to see birds and bird watch, um, then you're going to go to a few of the few of the companies that are doing that. Um, now the market has changed. There's a lot more competition than there was in 1985. In 1985, we may have had three or four companies doing what we do. And now there's, you know, a hundred doing it. And there's also a lot of local operators and smaller guides that are working in these countries that can offer services. So the market mm -hmm. is very competitive. Um, but yes, uh, people, once they start traveling, um, they're going to want to keep going and seeing different birds and going to different countries. And so they're going to, if they like field guides and they like traveling with field guides, they're certainly going to come back to us and, and do more tours with us. Yeah. Um, two, two things. Uh, f first one is I, I can relate to it, even uh, and this might sound completely left field, but I, I play golf and I've been playing golf mm -hmm. for over 20 years and if you ask any serious golfer uh, about do they really enjoy traveling all around the world playing in different countries different types of golf courses different conditions most of them will say yes you know they they, mm -hmm. they thrive on it you know for lads tours away if you like um it, it's kind of there's always those ones that just want to go away and get drunk and stumble around the golf course but the groups that i'm involved in and what i'm seeing more and more is people actually taking it far more seriously where they they're spending their hard-earned cash uh going to play premium golf courses in really nice countries staying in lovely hotels and of course they're going to go out and, and they're going to have a few beers uh, after the game of golf and you know a bottle of wine with dinner but it, it the the experience is changing transitioning from the let's get drunk and play a bit of golf into we really want to enjoy this golf and and uh, enjoy the golf course and everything but to go back to the point was the uh, to relate to was people wanting to travel all around the world to just to play uh, a, a different golf course um, uh, and the second point i wanted to make was uh, you know relating it to let's say a, a tech SaaS business um, a subscription based you've actually got you know annual recurring revenue or monthly recurring revenue in a SaaS type model where people are repeat customers coming back coming back paying paying so you know it has to be managed in that the business has to be managed mm -hmm. in, in that way um, you also have to of course acquire new customers and I'm sure uh, a large part of that comes from word of mouth from those people that have had those wonderful experiences from you but you can't rest on your laurels you have to go out there and promote the business and um, uh, and try and drum up that but critical to to any uh, business with recurring revenue is those existing clients so you you know there's an absolute pressure on you to ensure that their experience continues to be the same standard and same level across uh, the board no matter which continent they go to they get the same expert level of uh, of service um, 
uh, where, you know, where, wherever they go. No, that's exactly right. And I should I should preface this by saying that we sell we sell experiences. I mean, we're we I think that's I, that at least that's the way I like to to approach it. We are you were mentioning having a good time in terms of you know having a, a beer at the end of a, a hard day of golf or, or 18 rounds or whatever, or enjoying the wine in the evening. We do a lot of that. There's a lot of revelry. There's a lot of experience sharing experiences. There's a lot of um, so there's a social aspect to all this. And I think birds, it, it's amazing to think about for me because that birds is what does that for us. It brings us together to share these experiences and these, and birding is maybe just an excuse for a lot of people, as I said, but if you don't have, if you don't have the toasts in the evening and the, you know, having a cold beer at the end of a hard day, stomping around a trail, looking for some small little bird that you, you may or may not have seen, then it, it's not, that's, Anybody can do that, but we're really what, what what we're trying to sell is experiences. We want you to be comfortable and safe, and um, and have a great time. You know, have fun doing this. And so, if you in in, in your experience, you want to go to Pebble Beach or you want to go to Augusta and you want to play those 18 rounds at these famous golf courses, but then I'd beyond love 18 that, rounds, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> being 18. Am old. I speaking right? I'm not a golfer. <laughs> but am I saying this correctly? I'm not. <laughs> um, but so it, but it's more than that. It's there's a spiritual pilgrimage of going to these places. There's the, oh, of course. There's just the aspect of being in those 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 um, those courses, and then the part afterwards where you're you're hanging out with buddies and you know talking about everything and enjoying it. Um, the the part about the the repeat clientele is is interesting. Our you know our model is very old school in that sense. I mean we haven't changed much of our marketing since since uh, 1985 since we started <laughs> we're really a, a company that relies a lot on word of mouth so those experiences what we're creating for people is important sure people can say yeah yeah we went to the country and we saw all the birds we wanted but they're gonna they want to we, what we want to hear is go with field guides you're gonna see all the birds you're gonna have a great time you're gonna be safe you're gonna be comfortable and that's really what why we're successful why we're one of the top companies in what we do yeah, I mean, to, to, I'll, I'll make this my last golf analogy, I promise. Um, <laughs> when I go and play a, a golf course, it's more than uh, the layout of the golf course. It, you know, there's the condition that comes into it. There's the facilities, the the ambiance and the staff and how it's made to feel. And uh, is there a drinks buggy on the course? You know, halfway house. Mm -hmm. Is there bins there? Ball washes. You know, how has my whole experience been? Uh, the first thing anybody ever talks about, of course, is the golf course and the condition of that, i.e., relating to did you see the birds? But then it becomes as soon as you've chatted about that, it becomes yeah, well, the clubhouse was needed renovating, and the staff weren't really friendly, and and then you, your experience starts to get soured, and then you kind of well. I've played that course once now, would I go back? Whereas if you've had a whole experience that was wonderful, you're more inclined to A, not only uh, you know, to, to go back, but recommend and, and refer. So. Yeah, that's right. And, and I, we've actually had clients that have taken the same tour with us again, sometimes two or three times. Uh, so that just tells you they loved, I mean, they've already seen the birds, so it's not about the birds anymore. Or maybe it's about the birds, but they've already seen them. So it's not about anything new, but it's about that experience. They love the lodge. They love the guide they're going with. They love the mm. the, the scenery, whatever it is. But yeah. So and some, sometimes, uh, like, for example, when I, we went on tour, uh, went to Egypt. Uh, my wife's from Egypt. We did a cruise on the Nile and at 5 or 6 a.m. every day off the boat, coach, and you go and see all these wonderful um places and, and things and the tour guides on coach all the way there mm -hmm. and then while you're there blah, 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 talking uh, so quickly and just talking about history which is fascinating and I, I really enjoy it but it was it's like a massive information overload and you spend half your time kind of looking up and around and trying to absorb the information um and you kind of get to the end of the day you're like god I, I can't really remember most of that. Um, it's not the tour guides, but perhaps it's just me, but a lot of people were having to write stuff down because uh, there was just so much information, it became very overwhelming. But we kind of came away from that trip and said, would we do it again? 
Um, and we said yes, uh, but we'd do it slightly differently, but at least, at least now we have the base knowledge. Uh, so there's a degree of comfort there, there's a degree of understanding of what's going to happen on the tour, you know, what, what to expect, so that, that isn't part of the overwhelming experience. You know, it's a known known, and uh, now we can sort of relax a bit and allow us to absorb some some more information and, and re bring our notes from last time and sort of fill in the gaps uh, from from that. So, yeah, well, that's I like think that. that's one big difference from our company too. And what you're describing there sounds a lot like um, sort of the cookie cutter tourism that exists in places because there's just massive turnover and there's no relationship with the clients when you have somebody. You have clients coming to Ruin X and you have a local guide there that's just going to give you the history spiel about that Ruin X and there's no there's no connection with the client. Now that tour, tourism exists and it's necessary in some places and for a lot of tourism that's the kind of tourism that there is but we we've we model ourselves completely different. We have full-time guides that work with us. Uh, we're a smallish company and so we are actually selling a tour experience with a guide. We, we actually want people to maybe even look at a tour and say, I want to go with, I want to go to Brazil because I want to see those birds in Brazil, but I want to go to Brazil with Jesse. I want to go to Brazil with, with Tom, or I want, I want to go with these guides because they're the kind of people I want to be around. And they're the kind mm. of people that are not, every time that you go on a tour, you want it to be unique to you. You want it to be your personal experience. And so if you have tourism, that's just this, you know, constant chatter. Manufactured, about, yeah. Manufactured about dates and this and that, and there's no personal connection. Um, that's most likely going to, you're not going to want to do that again. You know, you're, that's not the mm -hmm. kind of thing you may reevaluate. Now, I don't want to take that tour, that type of tour anymore. And so what we offer or trying to offer is our experience, unique experiences for you. For the client fantastic something else left field which our viewers and listeners uh, are, are likely to to not know and that is there's a connection between james bond and bird watching <laughs> i mean when you shared this with me i was like oh come on are you serious please i don't know if you did if you researched it after i talked about it but uh yeah it's kind of crazy because um you know, as we were talking, you know, there's a stereotype of what a yeah, there's a stereotype of what a bird watcher is, right? It's this there's this person looking at a feeder, you know, with their little binoculars and white tennis shoes. And uh and um, but yeah, so the story about that is that uh, you know, James Bond, the 007, the famous 007 character, uh from English, right? right? He's English. Uh, that was created by Ian Fleming, the writer Ian Fleming, when he was starting his his double 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 o seven series. I think this was the early fifties, right? When he was yeah. in Jamaica, so Ian Fleming had a an estate there. I was living in Jamaica at the time. I think the the estate was called Goldeneye, which eventually became the name of one of his his yeah. books. And um, so he was living in Jamaica, and he was writing his first book, the James Bond series, and he needed a title for the main character, for James Bond. And um, this is another kind of interesting factoid that Ian Fleming was a bird watcher. He was one of these birders that liked, I mean, he was an outdoors kind of guy. He liked the spear fish. He liked to go down to the beach and swim, kind of like the Magnum PI of, of Jamaica, you know? And, and he would, he would, he was a birder. He liked looking at birds and he, and he would note the hummingbirds or whatever else was coming into his backyard um, fruit, fruit garden. And, um, so he's looking for a title for his main character, and he had a copy of The Birds of the West Indies or The Birds of the Caribbean. And the author of that was a famous ornithologist working in the Caribbean called James Bond. And so he's got this book, and actually I have the book right here. This is a first edition, uh, English yeah. edition, US print right. from 1947. You heard and it when he was, fans. he had it right next to him and he looked down and he saw the name. He wanted a simple name that was kind of, you know, could resonate. And he looked at that and he said, James Bond, that's it. That's the name of my title character. And so the James Bond 007 that we know is actually named after a, an ornithologist that was working in the Caribbean at the time and wrote the birds of the West Indies. So we are cool. Birding's cool, man. 
Wow. So when I sent you when I sent you an idea, you know, what would Bond do? Uh, it was sort of a play on, you know, here we are in this pandemic, and you know, what would not not James Bond 007, but what would what would James Bond, the ornithologist, be doing right now during all of this? And and I just imagine that he would just be out birding. He'd be out looking at stuff. He'd be out observing, and he would, you know, not be worried about too much else that was going on. So. Uh. Uh, yeah, it's speechless. Awesome, isn't it? uh, speechless. You know, every, every time I watch a James Bond film now, I'm immediately going to not only think of you, but I'm going to think of birding, <laughs> which is something I did not imagine in my entire lifetime I would ever be thinking of when I was thinking of James Bond. And I haven't read all of the, I've read a couple of the James Bond books, but I don't know if it, if it and I haven't seen all the movies, but I know in places he, he sprinkles or peppers those stories with little little notes about the wildlife and the birds and the things. And that was because Ian Fleming liked to watch birds and he liked, he noticed stuff. He was a naturalist, I think. And he noticed yeah. this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I guess you know, now my awareness is heightened of it. There is several animals in uh, in the Bond, uh, Bond series, uh, the Bond films. So. Right. Wow. Um, so how did you get into this? And because that the, the, the leap that you took it, it, for me is as uh, monstrous as James Bond is a bird watcher. Um, do you want to just share with the viewers and listeners, uh, Jesse Fagan, the man, your career, what you did and how, what led you, you up to getting into birding? Sure, happy to, Lee. Um, so my story, I, you know, I grew up being an outdoors kind of guy. I grew up uh, loving the outdoors. I don't know if I would, maybe I was an environmentalist since I was a young kid, um, not to the extreme, but I loved being outside and looking at animals. And I always had a soft heart for pets. Uh, maybe that's where it started, was having a couple pets when I was younger and having a soft heart, a soft heart for animals. Um, but so I've been birding since I was a kid. You know, I've been looking at, you know, birds since I was a, you know, a child. And, but as you grow up, you don't ever think about, and it wasn't even part of my, in, in, you know, part of my world or even on my radar is that you can make a career from leading international bird tours. You know, you just don't grow up thinking about, but you, know, you grow up being, wanting to be a firefighter or an astronaut or something. But, <laughs> yes. um, so I, but I was into uh, science and music. And in fact, it's interesting because I wanted to be, I was a, when I was a teenager, I got into to hip hop music and I was DJing and I wanted to be a DJ. And uh, so I was, you know, spinning records and all that stuff, analog DJ at the time. And uh, so I wanted to go into music production. I wanted to do that sort of thing. And my parents were like, you know, is this a phase? You know, he's, <laughs> he's a, you know, he's a ninth grade in high school and he wants to be a, you know, a DJ. Is this a phase? What's happening here? But um, so, but they encouraged me to, to, to think about maybe the, the sort of the the um, the career aspect of it. You know, how am I gonna make some money? How, how, how am I gonna do this in life? And so I got to thinking that I would be really interested in audio production and engineering right. uh, from the music standpoint. So I, when I was in, when I started college, I went into college with an, in an engineering program. I was gonna do a couple of years uh, at the local university where I went to in Savannah, Georgia. I studied in Savannah, Georgia. I was going to do two years of an engineer, engineering course and then transfer, transfer to Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And I soon, soon realized after taking a couple of engineering courses that that wasn't for me. And I really love the mathematics though. I mean, I was really interested in the mathematics and I had always been a science kind of kid. I really liked science and mathematics and and, uh, and so I just changed courses and I decided to go full in on mathematics. And so I, I ended up graduating with um, an under, undergraduate degree in mathematics. And then I later transferred to Texas Tech, uh, University, uh, uh, Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. And I finished a master's, I did two and a half years of master's in, at Texas Tech. And I was looking for a job and I was very much a birder. It was a hobby, you know, but I was a birder Full and, full and through, you know, I was every evening or afternoon, I was going out birding if, if I wasn't working or if I wasn't teaching. 
Um, and then, you know, on the weekends, I was taking trips and going places and even taking international trips at that point to look for birds. But I was very active in the, during my master's in Texas, I was very active in the, in the birding scene in Texas, you know, birding groups and ornithological societies and, and, and that sort of thing. And I wanted to have, I liked teaching. So when I was an under, when I was, sorry, when I was doing my master's, I was a teaching assistant. So I was teaching courses at the university at Texas Tech uh, to help pay for my, my, my school, schooling. And, um, and I liked the teaching and it also gave me flexibility. This is my schedule. And I, you know, I could work around maybe making trips and have some time off. And so all that sounded really appealing. And when I got done with my master's, I said, what am I going to do? Am I, I want to maybe do a PhD. I was thinking about a PhD, but then I thought, no, I'm really burned out of school and I want to bird watch and I want to spend all my time looking at birds and how am I going to do this? And so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to teach. I'm going to get a, a job at a university. I'm going to have a flexible schedule. I'm going to may, maybe have Chris, you know, the holidays off, maybe have summers off, depending on what right. I want to do. Yeah. And, travel. Yeah. and, and that's what I did. And I taught for six years at the, at the university level in Texas and in South Carolina. You taught math, right? I taught mathematics. And at some point during that, because I was still active, I was traveling in Texas and all over the world looking at birds. I got, a, I got a, an email from Field Guides Incorporated. And it just so happened at that point, they were hiring. They were looking for a couple of new guides, young guides to come on and, and work with them. And they had heard my name because Field Guides is based out of Texas. And I was really active in the Texas scene, remember? Right. And so they had heard about me and they contacted me and they were like, are you interested in maybe coming on and doing some tours and possibly eventually guiding full time? You know, that's going to be your job is to travel the world and show people birds. Wow. And I was like, I was like, sign me up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes so yes. it's all, it's all, you know, life is like that, you know, it's securitist. There's a lot of different roads, but it's funny because every road that I took sort of eventually led me to where I'm at now. And, and it's, it's been, it's been a, been a journey it's been fun wow um maths teacher to international tour bird watching tour guide i mean <laughs> but uh, i know you what i really love in that story is that you had this passion for uh for birding and uh you just you 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 know you did something to to fund that 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 passion uh you know hobby and an interest you know you kept that fire there for you you definitely want to um do something with it as a, as as a career but you chose math to and not only did you choose math you chose to teach math i mean wow that well, makes me shudder the um my neighbors here have got three boys and uh, and it's a, it's a russian family and they they are maths geniuses uh, apparently one of them one of them is a real sort of uh, math genius but i was chatting to the other one uh, one of the boys just the other day um, socially distanced of course and he was telling me that uh, his lessons for the day was quadruple maths followed by uh, like triple physics or something i mean uh, <laughs> quadruple maths and triple physics quadruple <laughs> math i said that sounds like the idea of hell for me he said actually i quite enjoy it first and foremost and secondly um you get into a rhythm with it you know you because you're doing it constantly not chopping and changing subjects you know, you're sticking with one subject you, you sort of get into that mindset with it but well, um well i'm i was by no means the best mathematician and i'm i would say i'm a mediocre mathematician i mean I, i'm good at it i'm better than average obviously and i loved math uh, and i think i think for me it was just, you know, doing things that I love, you know, doing things that interest me and, and, and science and mathematics was always something that, that I was interested in. And, and, and so I focused in on those areas and, and bird watching is birding and, and the environment are all tied into that in some way, you know, it's science as well. I mean, mm -hmm. We're all, it's, a lot of this is tough, tough to explain and it takes science to explain a lot of it. So um, I think it's all connected, but um, yeah, I think, I think 
surrounding myself with things that I really enjoy and just focusing my efforts and, and putting my energies into those areas has been really productive for me. And, and I try to do that in as many ways as possible. Find, um, I was, I was, I heard something the other day, it was find your small worlds, find these small worlds that, yeah. that you can get into that really just absorb you, that just suck, suck a lot of attention, a lot of energy from you, because in some ways those things are going to come back those things are going to have some positive influence on your, on your life in some way. And, you know, mathematics was a positive influence and positive part of my life. It's not so much a part of my life anymore, unfortunately. And, and I have to say my math skills have gotten really bad. I mean, I was doing some stuff the other day and I was like, wow, I, I, there was a point where I could never have forgotten this. And it's been, you know, 15 years, 16 years since I've taught. And I'm like, I used to know this, but <laughs> what's happened? <laughs> I guess well, it's like a language or a, a muscle of some sort. You know, right. you gotta, you gotta practice. Yeah. Um, g given, given what has happened th this year, uh, and given the industry you're in, tourism and travel, uh, I don't think it takes a maths genius to work out that that. I can't say the business, but the industry has been decimated. You know, the, nobody's been traveling uh, and that's absolutely essential. So all tours canceled, I'm assuming, come, come March in, indefinitely, right? Yeah, it's, it's, been a, it's been a nightmare scenario, scenario for, for folks in the tourism industry. Um, I, I was looking at our numbers in the United States with still 20 million unemployed people. And, and um, I think more than half of those are in the service sector and the service sector includes tourism it's the hotels it's the drivers it's the mm -hmm. the restaurants and and a lot of that is is tourism now i'm in a unique position i think my job is fairly unique but um it is a service industry and of all the jobs that have come back because we've regained about um little over half of the jobs that we've lost, we lost at the beginning of the pandemic, we've regained. But the jobs that are still lost are the service industry. And, um, and that's us, that's, that's tourism, that's my job. And so, yes, I haven't worked uh, since March. I got back from a Panama tour on March 9th and I haven't, I haven't worked a day since. And um, that's been, that's, you know that's a nightmare scenario that's been very difficult and unfortunately with if you look at the type of tourism i do you know i work in a i work in tourism i work in travel tourism so i'm i'm going to different countries and the demographics the type of client that i'm that my clientele are people in the 50 to 80 year old range they're, they're in that demographic capacity. that's yeah. that's at most risk from this right so we're the last industry sector to come back. I mean, and so we're trying to figure out how are we going to stay afloat? How are we going to stay in business? And one of the things that we came up with was a, a new uh, subscription-based video content website. Exactly. And, and this is what we what I mentioned earlier on um, that I didn't want to sort of spoil, spoil the thunder on um, because I think this is, this is great. Uh, you know, and I was asked my uh, speakers about how you've pivoted the business to set yourselves up to uh, survive for now and then hopefully thrive because then when your your core business comes back you've still got this new, new business and I think what you, you're about to explain could could also open up to that new demographic and the slightly younger um, uh, uh, younger society mm -hmm. where they perhaps don't have the funds to and the time uh, to travel but still want that insight into this world so really looking forward to you sharing this yeah no that's exactly it and you hit the hit the nail on the head what we're trying to do here is um now we had to pivot we had to do something we had to generate revenue we, you know as a company we have we've had zero revenue from tours since march and that's you know that's a death sentence um but we had to do something to generate some revenue to cover some overhead costs and just to stay afloat a lifeline until we can get through all of this and so what we decided to do is create videos um something that we we have a lot of content and we can go out and for some guides we can go out and get new content um, but we started creating videos and we create a platform a subscription-based platform where people can come in and subscribe and pay a monthly fee or an annual fee or a lifetime fee um, the website's called outbirding.com, outbirding.com. 
and you go in there and you you can look at the content but it's 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 mostly it's it's birding videos it's field identification it's stuff that caters to our clientele there's also some fun food stuff in there recipes and how to make a caipirinha and mm. some cultural stuff and it's a mix of things but mostly focused on bird watching and the birding world but you're right i mean i think i think if we can get through this then we've got this tool we've got this extra thing that's been created and it's always going to be there and it's just going to keep generating revenue or generating interest or marketing for us um, but it's also a way to cross barriers and, and attract the 20 year olds or the 30 year olds or people that may be not able to travel right now because of family obligations or they don't have the funds yet but if they can get a subscription a monthly subscription then they can watch these videos and now they are aware of field guides they're aware of who we are and at some point they're going to want to travel exactly yeah tour and boom, you know they're gonna they're gonna sign up fan, so fan, fantastic yeah so you know it's creating an additional renewable revenue source you know you've got your existing core uh, client base that that repeat although they're not any subscription to, to come and travel they just do repeat uh, business anyway but then you're actually formally getting a uh, renewable revenue stream in um, and attracting new young people so I mean be best of luck with that it's, it sounds sounds exciting sounds uh, sounds the right path to, to go and um, I'm interested, you know. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out, um, and I recommend all the viewers and listeners to to do so, um, no matter your age. Um, well, so. it's it's we're not we're not David Attenborough's yet, but we're we're hoping to to be at that point at some at some point. You know, David Attenborough is uh, you know the way that he can talk with to the normal person and show them the beautiful this beautiful natural world that we have is worth protecting. It's worth observing. That's sort of what we're trying to get at. You know, if you can come on there and look at a few videos and just see, wow, there's all of this out there and it's super interesting yeah. um, you know that's but but you're right i think in the future these could play this could play really well into the tours that we run if i'm running a a, tr a tour to peru for example and i can say hey go check out that video on outburning you know i did a video on lima and or machu picchu and check that out you're going to really enjoy it it'll help you it'll set you up and it'll give you a little bit more background knowledge into the tour you're about to take something like that yeah Definitely. So, so March is uh, quite a long time ago. <laughs> what, what have you been doing? Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean the, the business. Um, you, Jesse, what have you been doing to keep yourself busy and sane and fit and healthy? And you know, how, how's life different for you? I've been twiddling my thumbs a lot. No, it's I, I've been I've been. It's funny because if you had asked me would I want a sabbatical three years ago? I, three years ago, I was, you know, I was doing five months. I don't know if I mentioned this, but, you know, I, I'm doing five to six months out of the year on the road traveling uh, the, my full-time birding schedule and tour schedule. So, you know, doing that year in and year out, you know, not seeing your wife or your family for five or six months out of the year. Um, three years ago, I would have said, yeah, I'd love a six month sabbatical. Give me a year <laughs> off and, you know, but I can come back to my job and my, you know, maybe get to have a little monthly pay or something. But right. um, this is not what I would have envisioned. Obviously, this is not, this is, a, this is no. not what I would have asked for. But I've, I've looked at this as a way to, to reset, to sort of, to sort of, okay, what's important in my life and where do I want to focus my energies and, and, um, and it also put into perspective that maybe I'm not going to be a bird guide my entire life. Maybe I'm not going to be an international tour leader my entire life. So if that's not the case, then how am I going to reinvent myself? What am I going to do to survive? And I think we all should have that conversation every once in a while because mm -hmm. nothing's guaranteed in life. And, and I've been fortunate to have a lot of things, opportunities, but, um, you know, hardship is, that's also commonplace in life. And so, what I've been doing is I've been waking up early. I've been I've been getting at it every day. I've been trying to focus on meditation, on my health, um, you know, and I've been trying to read more books and uh, work on these videos we were just talking about, and and um, and just and just try to and maybe get into other things that I had put off, you know, some of those back burner projects that I'd never gotten around to. Um, I'm also working on another field guide, a field guide to the Caribbean, which bond wrote but now i'm working on a, a new a new field guide for for that region so it's like 
when was I going to have the time to to focus on that? And and now I've got that time. So and, and you've um, been dabbling in the kitchen, I hear. Yes, that's right. Doing a lot of cooking because during the quarantine we weren't allowed to. I don't know if you can hear my dog barking. That's fine. Um, We're on an animal show. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> we, we love animals, but. Um, so yeah, so we during the pandemic here in Peru, it was pretty strict. We had a lockdown for for three months, a very strict lockdown, and there were no restaurants open. And you know, and you know, living in Lima, Peru, which is the culinary capital of the world, one of them, um, I was we would go out quite a lot, you know, and ceviche right. and lomo saltado and ají de gallina. And we love Peruvian food, but we were stuck in in the house, and we we had to learn to cook and survive and go shop and, you know, and so it was, um, it was a new experience, but it was great because now I love being in the kitchen. I, I, I love going downstairs and just putting on my music and, and just creating something, you know, cooking. So that's been, been fantastic. And I'm sure uh, your wife will thank me for this one, but spending time with her, um, that must have taken an adjustment because, um, <laughs> And, but no, but, but it's taken an adjustment for, for us here. And I live with my wife and I'm here all the time. But uh, prior to the lockdown, she would you know, come 7.30, 8 a.m. She'd be gone for the day out to work and then coming back at sort of 6.37. So I've got the whole day uh, in my own head and my own thoughts. And, and then we sort of you know, we, we reconnect in the evening. And now she's here all day. So that okay. dynamic changed um so i'm sure there was a, a an adjustment for for both of you but ultimately you know you haven't been away for so long for so long um i'm sure it was nice to spend that time with the wife right yeah and i met my but it's interesting i met my wife guiding i met my wife in cusco peru uh, 10 years ago and uh, we got married in 2014 so it's been six years but there's not this is the longest period i've ever been with my wife um since in 10 years that we've known each other because i was i'm constantly guiding i'm constantly on the road and it's yeah it's been it's been a learning experience but i think you know it's been all positive you know it's all it's been good to spend a lot of time with her and and she's working at home as well now so that's it's not like i'm i'm at home now but then she's been going to the office so she's right. at home as well because she's she's in she's working from from home office now so um, so we're really together 24 seven and, uh, but yeah, it's been great. I, I don't know if you asked her, maybe she'd be ready for me to start guiding <laughs> you, but, uh, uh I'm not that, nice. I'm not that stupid or brave. <laughs> uh, <ask> that one. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you've done some, some reading and, uh, part of the show, um, I like to do is always get guests to share, uh, reading that they've done either before lockdown that was influential on them or or during lockdown that sort of kept, kept them entertained that the you know perhaps you can share with other people um and it doesn't necessarily just need to be books can be film shows etc but just stuff that you find inspiring that, uh, that others might benefit from sure yeah well I, I think i sent you a few but the last four books i i read during the pandemic were and, and i've read actually more than four but these are the last four that i read but the last four i read were quite all over the place, you know. I, I've been getting a lot into um, s sort of interstellar space and time warps and black holes. So I read a couple of books on those. I read one by, actually, it's a book that came out in the '80s by Stephen Hawking, uh, "A Brief History of Time," and yeah, uh, and so one. you probably have that one. It's a quite popular one. It was it was it was written for a you know sort of a a lay person <laughs> audience, and uh, but it, it does a good job of of laying out sort of the idea of these these black holes and, and time warps and you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, the other one I read was Black Holes and Time Warps uh, by Kip Thorne, which was really good. That came out in the 90s and that was more technical, but uh, I really, really enjoyed that one. And um, yeah, and then I read uh, William Faulkner's Light in August, just because I wanted to have a classic. I was just, I'm gonna read some classics I thought, so I've been picking up different classics from here, you know, here and there and, and reading those. And, and that was, um, a race relations, 1920s race relations and religious theme. It was a bit deep, and William Faulkner is hard to read at times. He's, he can be quite wordy and prosy, but um, but it was really interesting to read. And then, and then the one that I read just most recently was called the Happiness Hypothesis, and it seemed 
it, 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 it seemed to speak to me in the moment because I mean, with the pandemic and all of this craziness that's going on in the world, either politics or the environment or the pandemic or you know, job losses, whatever it is, I think we're all going through a really emotional, psychological, difficult time. You know, this is probably the first Absolutely. time for a lot of us in our lives where we've had to, we've had all this flood of emotions just going through us every day. And for me, it's been, and like I was saying earlier, I've been, I've been proactive in this, but I've also had my ups and downs. It's not been every day is like this because I've had <laughs> these days. And I think my, my, my mindset has done that quite a lot. And so I, I picked up this book. It had been recommended to me years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago even. And I had a copy and I just, I hadn't really read it or I'd read parts of it. And I, I looked at the title and I said, I'm gonna read this. And it's been really helpful for me to sort of analyze and look at life differently in terms of flipping, flipping negatives into positives or that, or that sometimes negative situations are good for us. Um, and, and, some, and so we have to think about them as just a, a transition, transition and a process of growth for us. And, um, and so that's been really good. That's the, ha the happiness hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. And that's um, been really great. Yeah, uh, that that one you, you mentioned to me uh, p previously on our call. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's on my wish list um, to to get from said popular uh, online shopping store. Um, Jesse, uh, I've learned so much having spoken to you, um, and you know you're you're you've got an inspiring story. Um, your energy is fantastic and and uh, i'm so glad that we were able to uh connect you you were referred to me uh by a great friend a mutual friend of ours uh, steve burton who i'm sure uh will be thankful for the shout out um and i'm so glad he did because you know i've really enjoyed the chats we've had and i've so much enjoyed recording this podcast and i hope that the viewers and listeners have uh, have enjoyed it just as much as i have Lee, I really appreciate it. It's been fun talking with you and getting to know you as well. And I think that's part of all of this as well is I think there's been a lot of connection and connectivity between people, at least through, you know, social media and, or Zoom or whatever it is. But um, I don't think I would have gotten to know you, you know, if this pandemic hadn't occurred. And so I think, again, another positive that has come out of this and it's been really, really nice getting to know you and talking with you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share my experience. Uh, absolutely. So not, not only have we learned that James Bond uh, is a bird watcher, um, but a salesforce.com consulting business owner in the UK can connect with a bird watching international tour guide in Lima, Peru. I mean, That's come right. on, there we go. Jesse, thank, thanks so much. Um, uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in for another episode of Business Source.